The hearing is called to order. I appreciate the, the witnesses for appearing today. Uh, the point of today's hearing is to hear directly from small oil and gas producers regarding the barriers the Federal Government has enacted and the frustrations they face in producing oil and gas on Federal lands. I doubt that there is a member on this committee who doesn't receive a call from a constituent every day regarding high energy prices, the poor state of the economy, the lack of jobs, or the Federal Government's enormously high budget deficit. President Obama claims that the solutions to these problems are complex and that there are no easy answers or solutions. However, I believe we will hear today there are things the government can do to address all of these concerns in part by producing more energy at home. Expanding domestic energy production will bring more oil and gas to market, helping ease rising gas prices. Expanding domestic energy production will create jobs, both with the firms drilling for oil and gas and those that support these activities. Finally, expanding domestic energy production will bring new revenue to the Federal Government without raising taxes through the payments of rents and royalties on lands leased and those put into production. The ability to produce more domestic energy exists. Unfortunately, what has not existed is the will on the part of this administration to utilize the oil and natural gas we have. In the past few years, the number of new Federal lands available for oil and gas production has dropped significantly, along with approval of permits to drill. While the administration likes to claim oil production has increased under its watch, the U.S. Energy Information Agency has found that overall production in below, is below previous estimates and are projected to fall further. Addressing these declines has been a priority of this Congress, and a number of legislative proposals have been introduced and voted out of the House to open up America's energy potential and expand business opportunities for small firms. Unfortunately, these are still awaiting action in the U.S. Senate. At the same time, an oil or gas lease is worthless unless the company can, obt can obtain a permit to drill. This is why I have introduced legislation that would require BLM to annually inventory and report the 200 non-producing lands with permits to drill pending um, that they have the highest potential for oil and gas development and requires the BLM to issue these permits within 180 days of issuing its report. I will agree with, president, with the President that expanding domestic production of energy is no panacea to our nation's ills, but it offers part of the solution and a solution that releases the entrepreneurial spirit of small businesses is preferable to policies that impose excessive regulations and new taxes on the very small firms we, uh, we all look at to help rescue us from our current predicament. Let me go over the hearing rules just for a second. Uh, if committee members have an opening statement prepared, I ask that they be su submitted uh, for the record. I would like to take a moment to explain the timing lights uh, for, for you. You will, have, you will each have five minutes to deliver your testimony. The light will start out as green. Uh, when you have one minute remaining, the light will turn yellow. Finally, it will turn red at the end of your five minutes. I ask that you, that, uh, you try to keep uh, to the time limit, uh, but I will be a little lenient um, as you finish. Uh, and keep in mind, uh, we can put your written statements uh, in, in the record as well, uh, so you, you know, you're, you're free to uh, talk in a more informal manner. Um, let me introduce first uh, Tim Barber uh, from Yates Petroleum uh, Corporation. Uh, our fir first witness today is Tim Barber of Yates Petroleum Corporation. Yates Petroleum is a 425 employee. Uh, oil and gas production company with operations in New Mexico, Wyoming, and Colorado. 
Mr. Barber works uh, in the company's uh, Gillette uh, Wyoming office, where he currently serves as manager of regulatory affairs. Uh, Mr. Barber, uh, you may deliver your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my comments here today uh, faced on, are based on direct experience with Wyoming BLM, uh, and I think there are two foundational problems with how BLM is conducting itself that I believe you are uh, you're interested in. Uh, number one, BLM and Interior are daily added, adding unneeded and duplicated regulation through policy making, guidance documents, instructional memorandum, and individual staff interpretation, none of which go through a rulemaking process or are approved by Congress, but are treated as if they were actual rule or regulation. I call this entrepreneurial regulation. Number two, BLM is not following its foundational actual rule and actual law that it is required to. Ironically, the reason many times that they give for not following the foundational regulation is that they are too busy working on number one. Let me provide some specifics. Onshore order number one spells out an orderly process for the approval of APDs, which we may know as applications for permits to drill that binds BLM and the applicant to processing timelines. The onshore order process should not take any more than 90 to 120 days for BLM to approve an APD. At the BLM office in Buffalo, Wyoming, applicants regularly wait two years after their application, and some applications have been in that field office for five and six years awaiting approval. Some of the lengthier APDs have been hostage to the resource management plan amendment process, which has delayed the working of those APDs. The Buffalo BLM office was, um, interestingly, funded with additional monies by Congress to be able to uh, be capable of approving 3,000 APDs per year. I have included in your packet a BLM spreadsheet of their APDs uh, that they have approved this fiscal year. They have approved only 80 wells since October 1, 2011, and during the period between December 7, 2011 and February 29 of 2012, uh, though over 940 drilling permits were awaiting approval, no APDs were approved. Uh, included in your handout uh, in information is an overview of the timelines that are in the actual regulation for your review. When an affected party has a problem with a BLM decision, their only um, path available uh, to pursue an appeal is to go to a, a process called a state director review, and that is provided for in onshore order number one. Uh, state director review decisions are required by regulation to be issued in 10 days. In Wyoming, these appeal decisions are taking nine months or more. BLM's duplicated and conflicting efforts are very concerning to me. Uh, some examples are BLM's working currently on a policy for hydraulic fracturing for federal mineral wells. States all over the place, like Wyoming, already have an agency that regulates all wells, not just federal mineral wells. There is no need for BLM to embark on this effort. In Wyoming, BLM has recently come up with an instructional memorandum on the use of drilling pits for federal mineral wells. Same situation exists here. There is a state agency that has regulation in place that covers all wells. There is no need for BLM to add another layer of regulation. On a local level, BLM offices are coming up with their own preferences on things like how to build roads, reclamation of closed locations, requirements for well control, and even how to apply for a drilling permit, even though actual regulation already exists for each of these situations. The net effect of these non-rule regulations is that the agency accomplishes less at a higher cost to the agency, a higher cost to the taxpayers, and the regulated community. Longer APD processing times, arbitrary decisions not based on actual regulation, and less viable oil and gas projects, and less potential for drilling and production are the reality. It is my opinion that there are two primary paths to resolution here. A, Congress should strongly consider auditing offices like the Buffalo BLM office to find out what has been accomplished 
with the additional budget resources that has been provided to them. And I am sorry to say that I don't think that you will like what you find. The audit process should be ongoing with weekly or monthly updates provided as to uh, things like APD processing. I think the privilege of an e increased budget should come with the responsibility of demonstrating that that budget is bearing fruit. Secondly, Congress may want to uh, provide direction to the agency, its director and interior regarding what I have called entrepreneurial regulation. The direction can come in several forms, including defunding the agency when it heads in the wrong direction. BLM's resources and strength is best focused on managing lands for multiple use, not building layers of personal interpretation dressed up to look like actual regulation. I wish to thank you for your time and for your attention, and I would consider it a great opportunity to answer any questions that you might have for me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barber. Um, Dave Ewing, uh, President of Ewing Exploration uh, Company. Uh, our next witness is uh, Dave Ewing, uh, President of Ewing Exploration Company, a small uh, uh, prospecting company based in Sugar Land, Texas. Mr. Ewing uh, has been involved in the oil exploration business for several decades, working for both independent uh, as well as major oil production companies uh, before starting his own firm. Uh, he will testify today regarding the problems his company has experienced in developing a project in Wyoming. Uh, Mr. Ewing, uh, you may deliver your testimony, please. And uh, good morning, members of the Small Business Committee. Um, my experience in North America spans better than a couple of decades. I've, I've been 60 years with emphasis on the Rocky Mountain States, Gulf Coast, and Western Canada. I'm here today to discuss BLM decisions which are causing the possible loss or probable loss of a high quality high reserve potential oil prospect in the southwestern portion of the Bighorn Basin in northern Wyoming. In 2005, our company initiated an exploration program to locate drillable prospects in that southwestern Bighorn Basin, uh, looking for folded anticlinal structures which there in that basin are critical to entrapment of oil. To date, in excess of 3 billion barrels of oil have been produced in the basin from structures and every known structure has been drilled, with almost every one being productive. The only remaining area in the basin where a structure could elude the, have eluded the drill is in the area where my company is exploring. In the southwestern portion of the basin, you have geologic structures formed at the same time as all the other productive structures were formed. When Yellowstone Park erupted 800,000 years ago, blue ash in the air, moved to the east, there was a lake in the Bighorn Basin at that point in time. That ash dropped out in horizontal layers, sedimentary volcanics on top of those structures, uh, causing you not to be able to map those structures like you had in the balance of the basin, just looking at surface data. We, to develop a structural picture under those flat-lying sediments, we first purchased 70 miles of existing seismic data. And that based on that interpretation, we bought over 4,500 acres of federal, state, and fee lands. And of the 28, almost 3,000 acres we purchased from the BLM, they evaluated them under the old RMP using NEPA, uh, uh, NEPA regulations. In June of 2008, we shot two new red seismic lines. They are, that's me, yeah, okay. Could we put that map? Up, please. I'm going to keep going. Uh, we shot two additional red lines and uh, to develop better structural picture. Again, to do those, to do that seismic, we had to go to the BLM and get them to approve everything to do with those lines, including all the NEPA analysis that was required. In September of '09. the BLM issued to us a, a permit for a 6,500-foot exploratory well. The permit approval took better than a year to, to get, but when we drilled the well, uh, we, we got a dry hole, but it got information that said we should be considering additional exploration in there. Additional fee and state leases still not shown up on the map in green and purple. There we go. 
Okay, uh, the blue leases on the right are the nominated leases that we put up for sale in 2010, November. They were the day I flew into Cheyenne the day before the sale. They pulled those parcels down, said they needed additional NEPA analysis. Uh, the, in amongst that blue, you'll see a purple lease. That's a, a state lease, five-year lease, which is in its second year, close to being in its third year, and we're going to get five years on them. Uh, the, the red, the yellow, the buff uh, to the west are leases that we bought from 2006 through 7, 8, and 9, which put us, uh, put us in a position to drill that first well I talked about. When we drilled the well, uh, we tried to post against that one little 160 acres in purple, and it turned out that uh, the, they didn't get that. Uh, we didn't, there was a, a conserva uh, uh, they did not issue the lease until after we drilled the well offset to the lease, which fortunately, I guess you'd say it was a dry hole. Um, after they, we did that, then uh, I posted, they told us that they would post the acreage again in 12. They pulled it, uh, in, pulled it down a month ago in February of 12. Uh, at this point, uh, we, they've told me that now those leases will not come up again until the earliest in 2014, that all contingent on approval of the consolidation of the RMPs currently underway in the Bighorn Basin. Uh, to conclude, I'd just simply say there are several questions that need to be addressed by your committee or to your committee. One, why did the parcel withdrawals occur without any regard for EEC's ongoing activities? Two, what was the BLM's motive for obstructing EEC's opportunity to acquire these leases? Three, was there a reasonable alternative available to the BLM? Four, why was the RMP consolidation undertaken in the first place? And five, why did the BLM not consider or give any consideration to the county commissioners who were part of the co-operators in the, in the approval of the RMP consolidation? They're frightfully mad, and I am through, Your Honor. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Our next witness is uh, Ms. Uh, Kim Rodell. Uh, she serves as senior uh, project manager for uh, uh, Banco Petroleum, uh, a nine-person engineering consulting uh, firm headquartered in Anglewood, Colorado. Uh, in her capacity as senior project manager, uh, Ms. Rodell uh, uh, assists small independent oil and gas producers with federal regulatory uh, compliance. She will be testifying regarding the inconsistent implementation of policies she and her, and her small firm's uh, customers experience in complying with federal regulations. Uh, Ms. M Rodell, please uh, deliver your testimony. Hello, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, again, my name is Kim Rodell, and I am with Banco Petroleum. We assist companies in navigating the federal regulatory maze. The oil and gas, natural gas development in the West is critical to our economies and our growth. These critical jobs branch out directly and indirectly in a variety of different directions, from those working directly from the operators to those service companies to restaurants to retail. The growth in the economies is from people who, are, who have stable, well-paying jobs and who are willing to put money into their communities. Independent energy companies, often comprised of 12 or less, develop 95 percent of the oil and gas wells within our country. These businesses produce 54 percent of American oil and 85 percent of American natural gas. The oil and natural gas developments occur on both federal, state, and fee surface, and minerals, I apologize. However, because of the uncertainty of operating on federal lands, many of those who are willing to invest in these developments turn to the state and fee minerals, cutting out any potential royalty payments to the federal government. We encounter a lot of challenges like everybody else. Our biggest is the inability to plan and the uncertainty as to when approvals may be issued. The, along with approvals, conditions of approvals are attached to these permits. And sometimes, although we, we may know what might be attached, these are never finalized until the final permit is issued. Conditions of approval oftentimes, oftentimes include timing limitations due to wildlife. 
These timing limitations can place very tight drilling windows on operators, sometimes as tight as 45 days. In the Rocky Mountain region, we drill in complex geologic zones, with the, well, with the average well taking 90 to 120 days to drill and complete if not longer, if the geologic structure is more complex or downhole issues are encountered. Our biggest concern right now is the sage grouse, which is a non-threatened and endangered species. This bird has been creating devastating uncertainty in the West. The protections put in place on this bird are, resemble those close to a true threatened and endangered species. The protections put on these hunted birds um, give us, you know, there's, it, give, it doesn't allow us to plan because there can be so many limitations along with um, areas that we have to avoid completely, uh, no surface occupancy and restricted surface occupancy areas, sometimes never listed on the initial leases. The birds live in sagebrush habitat throughout the West, basically everywhere where oil and natural gas development occurs. While BLM is trying to protect both the numbers and contiguous habitat, those of us who operate understand the need for those protections. However, getting restrictive limitations with regards to the BLM and the divisions of wildlife make it very cumbersome. While, planning a drilling, while trying to plan a drilling schedule, small operators are more limited than their larger cousins, who sometimes have areas in different geologic in geographic areas and under different timing limitations. So they can move rigs, staff, and equipment, while those smaller independents often are in one geographic area and are often restricted to wading through those timing limitations and the inability to plan in such an uncertain in regulatory environment. Again, these, the small operators are affected. They've, they've invested money and time, equipment, and they're put on hold. Onshore independents employ 2.1 million, million people, and this figure is anticipated to rise to 2.6 by 2020. Approximately 63,000 man hours are needed for every individual well drilled. The federal government receives $40 in royalty and leasing bonus payments to the federal government for every $1 invested in um, in the onshore, the natural gas and oil onshore program. Just to give you an example, I am currently working a project with, in a federal unit which has 37,000 acres. We have been working on an access issue for over two years now. This basically locks up 37,000 acres of, of mostly federal minerals and the inability for these companies to hire in these areas. After several meetings with the BLM prior to the submission of the permits, um, we were given one option. We did everything necess necessary, including meeting with the BLM and all the, the agencies who, um, who were involved in the project. And approximately six months later, the, the permit was returned, unapprovable and denied. At this point, there's 37,000 acres of federal minerals locked up along with jobs and royalties. We work and live in these communities. We pay our taxes and send our children to school in these communities. We enjoy a healthy outdoor environment and are proud of the West. We also strive to ensure that future generations enjoy both the beauty and strong e economies that we have experienced. We would like to do our part to promote, responsible, to promote the production of responsible energy and build a secure energy future. I appreciate your time and thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Rodell. Uh, our next uh, witness is uh, Mark uh, Squillace. Did I say it right? Correct. All right, I got it right. And Mark, Mr. Squillace is, a, Squillace is a professor of law and director of the National uh, Resource, uh, Resources Law Center at the University of Colorado Law School. Uh, Mr. Squillace, um, uh, you may now deliver your testimony, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and good morning. 
I'm delighted uh, to be here to offer some of my views about the opportunities and, and some of the obstacles that are facing uh, small oil and gas operators on our public lands. Uh, as the Chairman noted, uh, I am a professor of law at the University of Colorado Law School. I want to emphasize, however, I appear, I appear here today on my own behalf and not on behalf of, of the University. I, I want to note first that my written testimony emphasizes five key points. Uh, those are that uh, planning and environmental assessment are important to sound decision making, uh, that the BLM's uh, process for um, administering leasing, leasing is problematic to the extent that they protect existing leases at the expense of uh, new lessees like small operators who might come on our public lands. Uh, in the testimony, in the written statement, I highlight some of the innovations and best management practices that uh, oil and gas developers have used. And, and some of these developments have really been spurred, I think, by some of the small operators, and they d deserve praise for that. Um, there are, however, some concerns uh, that some of the innovations are expensive to implement, and the agencies do need to be careful to make sure that uh, companies are not undercapitalized and can um, uh, have the, the finances to complete uh, the work on their oil and gas leases. And finally, I do want to uh, give a shout out, if you will, to the Environmental Protection Agency for what are likely to be forthcoming air emissions regulations. I know they are somewhat controversial. Uh, but I think they are long overdue and, and necessary to protect the public health and to conserve our hydrocarbon resources. Um, this morning, I would like to just emphasize the first two points. I am happy, of course, to answer questions about any of these five points. So let me, let me turn uh, first to the uh, question about uh, the BLM's planning and environmental assessment kinds of procedures. Uh, I, I understand the concerns that have been expressed by some of the witnesses today, and I certainly don't defend unreasonable delay on the part of the agencies in issuing permits and uh, giving approvals. But we should understand some of the context here. I would note, for example, a recent reporter noted that there are 7,000 approved APDs that have never been drilled upon. Um, it is also true that there are many leases, thousands of leases that have been issued by the BLM that have not been developed and there are no pending APDs uh, on those leases. Uh, moreover, it is important to note that environmental assessment can't be blamed for all of the problems that we are seeing with APDs. As a result of the Energy Policy Act of 2005, uh, many of the APDs are categorically excluded under NEPA, meaning there is no NEPA analysis that is done. The GAO did a study at the end of 2009 suggesting that many of these categorical exclusions were unlawful. And, and I don't want to debate, debate the merits of the study or, or this, but just to note that environmental assessment can't be blamed for uh, many of these. There is another important point to emphasize here regarding uh, drilling, which is it is very difficult right now to get a rig because of all the demand for oil and gas development, particularly oil development. There are just under 2,000 uh, rigs operating in the United States today. My understanding is it takes at least six months uh, to get a rig onto a site. In, in many cases, it takes uh, something longer than that. Um, I want to be clear that I don't think the process always works as well as it should. Uh, it's one thing to say that processes are good, another thing to say that uh, it works well. I'm not sure it does work well. In particular, I've been critical uh, of the agencies for their planning processes because I think they're far too complex. They could be simplified. I think one of the unfortunate consequences of complex planning is that it takes resources away from site-specific analysis. Um, and, and oftentimes that site-specific analysis becomes very rote. It is boilerplate. It doesn't really help promote better decisions. And so I think that is uh, uh, problematic. Uh, nonetheless, um, there are, I think, good things to be learned from the environmental assessment process. And I, I want to respond, I think, to the comment that Ms. Rodell made about, about the sage grouse, which is, I think, a really critical issue. And she rightly points out the, the controversy regarding the sage grouse. Um, there are, uh, it is true that the sage grouse has not been listed under the Endangered Species Act. It is also true that in 2010, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service issued a ruling that said that the sage grouse listing was warranted but precluded, kind of a technical legal term that suggested indeed there is evidence to list the sage grouse. It is just that there are other priorities that are of a higher priority for the agency. And, and the important point here is that it is in none of our interest to see the sage grouse listed. And if we are to avoid listing of the sage grouse, we have to engage in robust planning to ensure that uh, proper controls are put into place. This is particularly true today 
where we have uh, horizontal drilling and multiple well development on pads where you can have um, uh, you can move the, the pad around to avoid some of the conflicts uh, that exist. Um, I see I'm running out of time, but I'd like to just briefly address the second issue regarding um, overprotection of uh, existing leases by the BLM. Uh, this is a huge problem, and to understand it, you have to understand some things about the Mineral Leasing Act. It was, its purpose was to discourage speculation, uh, to, to avoid monopolization of Federal resources, and to assure a fair return uh, to the government uh, for its resources. And a lot of that has been undermined by the uh, government's policy of allowing uh, less existing lessees to get into units, which allows them to avoid the 10-year primary term uh, that exists under the Mineral Leasing Act. Under the law, you get 10 years if you're not developing. Uh, at, the, at the end of that 10 years, the lease is supposed to expire. The problem is you can avoid that expiration if you go into a unit. Um, the other, I think, significant problem here is that there are acreage limitations under the Mineral Leasing Act. No individual company uh, can own more than 400, 246,080 acres in a single state, um, and that is to avoid the monopoly problem. Uh, but if you go into a unit as a result of the Energy Policy Act of 2005, it doesn't count against your state limit. I, I think it is somewhat shocking to note that in January uh, of 2011, uh, there was a story in the Oil and Gas Journal about Encana Energy Company and the fact that Encana was um, bragging about the fact that it holds 869,000 acres of leases in the Peonce Basin in Colorado. Now, that is more than three times uh, the, the Federal limit. I want to note that those aren't necessarily all Federal leases, but the Peonce is 80 percent Federally owned. And the only way they can do that is if many of these are in the units and they are avoiding the acreage limitations. They brag that they owned the basin. And this is one of the most productive basins in the country. Something really needs to be done here. I would urge the committee to get a, a, the General Accounting Office to do a study of some of the problems that exist with the practice. This really harms small operators because if uh, those leases had terminated, they would go back into the pool and small operators would have a chance to bid on them and they would be developed. They are now languishing. They are not being developed. Um, uh, the, the article in the Oil and Gas Journal suggested it would take 35 years or more for Encana to develop all of its oil and gas resources. This is a real problem, and I want to encourage the committee to look at ways in which we can increase transparency, have BLM rules that uh, promote uh, unitization in ways that are better for, for the small oil and gas operators. I am sorry for going over my time, but thanks for your indulgence. Uh, thank you so much. Let me. Um let me ask uh, a first question, and then um, uh, I'm going to defer to uh, Congressman um, uh, Alan West of, of Florida, and then uh, we will probably, obviously, since there's two of us, we will do a second round uh, if necessary. But from in in Colorado, uh, and this is maybe anecdotal, but in talking to the oil and gas companies, it seems that the, there's very limited interest in public lands at this point in time, and, and I think across this country, and I think the movement is to fee lands. And so when we see increased uh, the reports of increased drilling or development in the United States, it seems to be off of public lands on to fee lands. And uh, I wonder if, uh, number one, is that true? And number two, um, how do you account for that? Uh, wh why, I mean, I mean, I don't see any appetite whatsoever right now. Uh, in terms of new development on public lands? Yeah, Mr. Barber. It is a very good question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly there is um, uh, more quick opportunities and uh, a smoother uh, planning ability when, when state and fee lands are, are minerals are uh, pursued. Uh, in some areas, like the Powder River Basin where I, where I work, two-thirds of the minerals are owned by the Federal Government, so you really have to be in the in the federal mineral um, game in order to in order to develop one of the things that worries me is that in in basins in in formations where um, where porosity is high and minerals can flow whether it's natural gas or oil the federal mineral estate because it's not being developed as quickly as the state and fee minerals can actually change ownership 
by moving from one leasehold area across through a well bore that is actually producing. So if I am here in Section 1 with a Federal lease that I am waiting for a permit on and surrounding me there are privately owned or State owned minerals, those minerals under the right geologic circumstances can actually change hands. And so those minerals that could have been produced and paid royalties to the Federal Government and uh, ultimately to the State uh, are, not, uh, are not produced. And that is very concerning. I wonder if the uh, if the uh, American, if the if the the public in the U.S. knows that the that potentially their minerals may be produced up somebody else's well bore. Hmm. Any other comments on that? Yes, uh, Ms. Rodell. Um, I often I often see the overarching regulatory agencies and the uncertainties in which the smaller operators, the environment which the smaller operators are looking at and operating in. Um, definitely turns them away from operating on Federal lands. And although some of these Federal lands are, you know, they are 10-year terms, sometimes it takes us eight years to get to even the process of submitting some APDs. Leases can be nominated, they can be paid for, and they cannot be issued. So there are times when we are waiting for leases to be issued or we are going through some environmental. And again, I stress the environment is important to all of us. But we can have so many different layers. And currently we have got 11 Federal agencies that are trying to take aim at the oil and gas um, companies. These oil and gas companies cannot, they cannot plan in such an uncertain environment. And so they do. They move to fee and state minerals because the process takes a fraction of the time. Although the, oftentimes the same parts of the the operations are put in place. The permitting can take, you know, it, it usually can take less than 30 to 60 days. Okay, Mr. Squalachi. Yes, um, I think I don't want to dismiss certainly the points that have been made about the problems with overregulation and and the difficulties that some of the companies have been have been having, but it is important to keep in mind that natural gas is at an historically low price right now. The general counsel for one of the major companies told me recently that they are not even looking at gas plays at this point in time because of that low price. They, she told me that they can't make a profit on uh, gas plays. And I think that is certainly having an effect on lower demand. Again, it is not the only thing that is going on. If you look in Wyoming, most of the plays are gas plays. There is interest up in the Niobrara uh, because those are liquid uh, hydrocarbon plays. And I think there is a, a lot more profit to be made in the liquid sector. Mr. Ewing, I'd like to comment on the on those remarks. Uh, my experience with Amico uh, for 15 years. I number one, I would like to comment about the unitization. We I fought that the entire time I was with Amico. We spent millions and millions of dollars. We had a huge staff. We ex we explored everywhere in Wyoming and in other states. Whenever you find a prospect area. You have to get seismic. You have to spend a lot of money putting the leases together and everything. And you get to a point where very quickly you are up to the 246,000 acres. And the only way that you are going to, once you buy that, that acreage, the only way you are going to get it off your books and make yourself legal is to form a unit. Now, when you form that unit, you are told you will drill wells by such and such a point in time. And if you don't, the unit will be terminated. So that is the manner in which people will go in and, and the professor says they are bragging about how much acreage they hold. They have got obligations in every one of those units down there that you are talking about. Uh, as far as uh, the fee versus Federal, I ran smack into that. I mean, these guys, I had 50 percent of the well we drilled up in the Bighorn was people down in the Houston area that I brought into the prospect. And when they were still with me when we were uh, nom nominated those lands to drill a second well. When I, they found out that the BLM had pulled down those leases, they just all called and said, sorry, we're out. So in effect, I lost half of my investors at that point. And a small operator lives on what he has and the investors that he can bring in, because there aren't many small investors, uh, operators who have the production wherewithal that will allow them to go out and, and take all the risk of the drilling themselves. So that, I want to make that point. 
uh, at some, I have a question myself. Will I have an opportunity to give you any testimony after the questioning uh, is completed? I'd like to. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Let me uh, do one more question, and I'll defer to uh, Congressman West uh, for some for some questions. And that is on these uh, uh, the deadlines that, that BLM has, uh, and I think that. Uh, Mr. Barber, you mentioned one specific deadline that was ignored. Uh, can you, what, are the ex what are the most uh, salient examples of deadlines that BLM has uh, that, that they ignore and that, that hurt uh, small operators? Uh, I'm referring to this printout slide that says APD processing. What does the regulation say? Um, when, uh, when, a, when an operator comes into uh, BLM, uh, with an application for permit to drill, the first thing they have to do is provide a $6,500 application fee. Keep in mind this is an application fee. It is not refundable and it does not guarantee a processing time or a permit. BLM is required by onshore order number one to follow these steps. Number one, they have to post the APD for 30 days prior to a decision. I think that is typically met by most field offices. BLM has 10 days to notify the operator if the application is complete. Some offices meet that and some offices don't, but it is specifically required in the regulation. BLM then has 10 days to schedule an on-site inspection. That is rarely met uh, in the offices that I work with. Uh, if deficiencies are identified, the operator has 45 days to respond to those deficiencies. Typically those are met because the operator wants to keep the uh, project going. And then once the deficiencies are addressed, if there are any, BLM has 30 days to reach a decision. That, uh, in my experience, is almost never met currently. And uh, when, when BLM doesn't meet these time frames, stretches out the process. I talked earlier about um, when an operator has an issue with a BLM decision, they go to an appeal at a state director review, and that process was set up to deliver a quick answer um, from the state office of BLM to the, uh, to the field office as to whether that field office's decision was correct or incorrect. Um, those are regularly now in Wyoming taking 90, day, 90 days or, or, or far more, many times close to uh, nine months. And when an operator doesn't get an answer on that, not only A, are they um, sort of robbed of their due process, but B, BLM keeps making that decision over and over and over, and it causes actually more of those appeals to happen. Okay. Ms. Rodell. Um, I agree with Mr. Barber. We understand that on sites can't be scheduled until there is um, there's no snow on the ground. So in the West, and that is my primary area of operations, sometimes we do have to wait. However, I, can see, I have seen the on site process take um, over a year just to schedule an on site. Uh, in addition, um, with, the, with regards to the 45 day deficiency response, I recently have run into that area where you do receive an official letter from the BLM. You respond to the deficiencies. However, I had three additional email deficiency responses come, all with very different deficiencies. These were not because the original deficiencies were um, not addressed. These were different deficiencies. And, you know, the consensus of the industry, of the oil and natural gas industry are these are just obstructionist moves to keep these permits locked up for years. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, Mr. West from Florida. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for the panel for the uh, long distances that you traveled to be here. And this is obviously one of the most important uh, conversations we can be having in our country right now. Uh, Dr. Squalacci, you uh, made a comment about the 7,000 approved APDs that have not yet been drilled upon. Uh, out of those 7,000, is it proven that all of them have resources that are there? I mean, these are not dry holes? Uh, uh, the point is that they have not been drilled upon 
at all, so we don't know whether they might find something or not. I mean, I don't want to suggest that because the APDs weren't drilled upon that there is necessarily a problem. I mean, the, what the industry needs to make choices and decisions about timing of development. If the price of gas, for example, goes down and it is not profitable for them to develop at that particular point in time, it may be a perfectly rational decision not to develop that particularly well, even if they have an approved APD. Um, the point is that from the agency's perspective, there is a lot of work that they are doing that essentially doesn't um, go into helping companies like these that we have heard from today get the permits that they need. And I don't know what the answer to this is. I mean, it would be nice if we could figure out a way to make sure that the agency's resources are used for those uh, permits where there is actually development going to take place. It doesn't always happen, it, it, and there, maybe there is no simple solution to it. But I do want to point out that from the agency's perspective, there are these sort of dislocations in terms of their allocation of resources as well. Mr. Barber. Thank you, Mr. West. Uh, I think it is important to understand that when an oil and gas operator shows up at a BLM office with, a, with an application for permit to drill, that they have to be very serious about that prospect, at least as they know it at that time. Uh, they might bring a 50-well project in, and they would need to cut a check for over $300,000 in order to just apply for those. Um, uh, they conduct archaeological surveys, wildlife work, many uh, processes to help the NEPA process move forward. What they sometimes don't know, uh, that I referred to a little bit in my testimony, is what that project will look like when it comes back from BLM finally approved. And many times those projects come, can come back so regulated and so gutted, if you will, that it is difficult to make an economical um, project out of them. We also uh, have to look at the market conditions that were referred to earlier, uh, things like pricing at that point in time, rig availability, et cetera. Yes, Ms. Rodale. Um, due to the uncertainty that these smaller operators try to operate in with the overarching regulatory structure, there is no planning. And sometimes an, a smaller operator, and these fees are $6,500, sometimes a small operator might have to put in 20 APDs, hoping that they can get two through the permit process to the time when they need to look at scheduling rigs. Um, you, no, rig contract, no rig company will sign a contract with an operator that does not have an approved permit. So sometimes these operators put in multiple permit um, applications, hoping to pull a handful of permits that have a drilling window that, I, they, that they can reasonably drill in and outside of timing limitations. Next question. And I am a pretty simple, oh, I am sorry, Mr. Ewing? Yeah, absolutely. I keep forgetting that. Um, in, in discussing uh, this situation with these uh, APDs, because of the recent bust in the, in the price of gas, that also has had an influence on some of the uh, attempts to go ahead and develop acreage. Uh, you, you know, you went from four in the last year, so you went from four dollars down to that what, two and a quarter, whatever it is now. And uh, when that gas, shale gas play got going, uh, many small operators, many small land people even, jumped in, grabbed leases, sold those leases to small companies. Small companies ultimately found out they'd bitten off way more than they could chew because of the BLM restrictions on regulations and the cost, ultimate cost of drilling and deviating a hole outward. So uh, a lot of the APDs that are still sitting there undoubtedly are not only related to what Mr. Barber said, but are, are people that got stuck with a situation that was not economic any further. Mr. Chairman, if you would be so kind, if sure. I could. Sure. Second question I'd like to ask, and, and I'm a very simple guy. On Inauguration Day in the United States of America, the average price of gasoline was $1.84. I spent 22 years in the military. When I hear people talk about there is nothing you can do about it, in the military, the maximum effective range of an excuse is zero meters. So in that time, from Inauguration Day to now, where we have gasoline prices at $3.77 almost per gallon across the country, 
I'd like to get from each one of you, what's the one golden nugget thing that you think can be done from Washington, D.C.'s perspective, from a federal perspective? Let's not talk about Iran. I mean, that'll take care of itself in due time. And speculators, because we have horrible monetary policy that's devaluating our dollar as opposed to the rising cost per barrel of, of oil. But from your perspective, in the domestic energy production side, what is the one thing that we can do to rectify this situation? Mr. Barber, starting with you. Thank you, Mr. West. I'm a simple guy, too. Uh, what, what I think. Uh, what I think happens out there, and I, and I don't want to represent myself as, a, as an oil and gas marketer, I'm not. But, but markets seem to respond to nervousness. And our markets are nervous about oil. They are. Things happen, the price of oil goes up. Other things happen, the price of oil goes down. From my simple perspective, what we need to do is put companies in a position so that they can explore for oil and gas on the leases that they have acquired so that that nervousness is reduced. I think right now with a tremendous supply of natural gas on hand, something could happen and I don't picture the price of natural gas tripling or going in half. I think there is plenty of supply out there. I think there is a reasonable presumption that we can, we can drill for more gas and acquire that. We need to be in that position on, on oil, on liquids. Yes. And so far as oil is concerned, I, I avoid gas plays like the plague. I don't, I don't, I'm not big enough to be involved in that. But the thing that needs to be done is to cut loose, get rid of some of the regulations so that people can explore for oil, n not, I mean, on these Western lands. And there are still things to find, but they're very difficult to find. And I was wanting to get into this historical perspective, if I could, a little bit on this. In 1946, the grazing service was merged with the General Land Office to form the Bureau of Land Management. They didn't really have any teeth to work with until the Federal Land Policy and, and um, Management Act, FLPMA, that I always forget what it stands for unless I read it, uh, came about in 1976. The Wyoming, State of Wyoming set up the Wyoming Oil and Gas Commission in 1951. And for until 1971, just after in the Nixon administration when NEPA had been authorized, they uh, administered all of the drilling. Ninety percent of the three billion barrels of oil that has been found in the Bighorn Basin came out of fields discovered before the BLM even got in the picture. The state administered all of these lands. The state had 45 people on staff. And not only did they have to approve any well, whether it's federal, state, or fee in the state of Wyoming, they had to do all the work. Suddenly, in 71, after the horses had gone out of the, out of the barn, so to speak, the BLM comes in and immediately had to start setting up an agency with a tremendous number of people with all sorts of regulations. And it happened at a time when instead of doing that, it should have just gone the other direction. Because in the case of the Bighorn, which is all I'm really talking about today, and I've had experience on all the basins, but that area in the southwest that I described where you have flat-lying beds obscuring the structure that still may lie we know there's some structure there. We just don't know the definition of it well enough. But there's probably some more production there. Other than that, I have no interest in looking for a structure elsewhere in the Bighorn Basin because they're all exposed on the surface. They've all been surface mapped. They've all been had seismic work on them, work on done on them. They've all been drilled, and 99 and 98, 99 percent of them have been productive. So what has happened is the BLM has come in and developed into a real monster after all of the major drilling in the Bighorn Basin took place. So if you look at that objectively, the rational mind would say, let's make it easier with what little bit we've got left. Now, if I've, I've given you uh, letters from my congressman, Pete Olson and Rob Bishop, who strongly are ob objecting to what the BLM did to me. I also have letters from all the commissioners that are in your packet, most of them in there. They're jumping up and down. They are, as I mentioned earlier, co-operators with the BLM 
in the RMP consolidation. And I want to say even further, that consolidation is the biggest, one of the biggest ripoffs that's taken place in the United States in years. They are doing this after all the drilling basically has been done and there is hardly any exploration still to be done. There was an 18,000 foot hole drilled right out in the flat, deepest part of the Bighorn Basin by Barrett Energy. They got 100 MCF a day. That is not a keeper. That is they have abandoned thousands of acres they took out there. I am probably the only, only company I know of, other than development, that some people are going around old fields just plunking little development wells they can still find. I am the only one that I know of up in that basin that is actually trying to explore for a virgin field. And I thought I had the opportunity to come up with a field that could be 5, five million to 10 million barrel potential. But they are just stopping me dead and actually they are putting my company out of business in the, in the Bighorn Basin. I operate on a, a low cash flow myself and uh, I have to have outside investors. And when I lose people, like I told you about a minute ago, uh, I am going to have a terrible time. Now, on top of that, because they have told me those leases, time out. I need to move. Keep going. All right. Ms. Rodell. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I am not a world economist. However, I Me do either. Know <laughs> Shoot, and there's two of us in the room. Yeah. However, oil is traded as a commodity on the worldwide market. Um, a resolution to that, I'm not sure I have one. I agree with Mr. Barber that so much of this is based on fear and worldwide unrest. However, I do think that if we can responsibly produce energy domestically, it might take some of the pressure off of those imports that we get from those, com those uh, countries. countries that are maybe not our best friends. Yeah. Um, in addition, though, we can, we can import or we can domestically produce as, a, as much, you know, to an extent, a whole lot of oil. However, then we get into a refining process. So it's, it's a much broader problem than just what can, what can we as small producers do. You know, the answer is I'm not sure we can do anything. So, uh, I'm also not a world economist, but this is a, a, an important question that we all care about as as citizens and as consumers of of oil and gas. And so, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to weigh in on this uh, important issue. Um, I, I'd like to point out a couple things, and I agree with much of what Ms. Rodell just said, but. Um, it is also true that domestic oil production is actually up in the United States over the past several years, and consumption is down. And one would think that on, under basic economic rules that if the supply goes up and the um, consumption goes down, that the price would come down. But, but as was pointed out, I mean, we are dealing with some global kinds of issues that are uh, difficult to um, reconcile with what is happening with, with prices. There is one interesting data point that I would like to share with the committee uh, regarding this. And that is a, a chart, I believe it has been published by the Energy Information Administration, that shows the price of oil along with the price of natural gas. And it shows sort of a trend uh, of the two uh, commodities. And it is very interesting to see how they have diverged radically in the past several years. I mean, it, it emphasizes what uh, Mr. Ewing said a moment ago about why he is not interested in gas plays. The price is so low, you can't do it. And, and what is interesting about that divergence is that the price of natural gas is really much more controlled by domestic uh, forces than is the price of oil. The price of oil is much more of a global kind of commodity. If we produce a lot more, there is at least a danger that it will be sold internationally if that is where the, the better price can be had, uh, because it is e more easily transportable than gas. But gas is, is much more problematic in terms of that. And because of all these uh, significant shale plays, the supply of gas domestically, locally has gone up uh, fairly dramatically. And I think that is why we are seeing uh, this significant decrease in the price. So I don't think there is any silver bullet here to deal with the problem. The one thing I would say that is critically important is that we continue the trend toward reduced consumption. And I think one of the best things we have done in recent years was to increase um, uh, the uh, miles per gallon of our, of our vehicle fleets. I think that is a, a really important step toward achieving energy independence. It is the one thing we really can, I think, do to affect uh, global prices. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I won't have a second round. But West, I didn't answer your question, as a matter of fact. <laughs> 
I don't, think, the, I don't think the chairman is going to give me any more time. Just give me two seconds to answer his question. If, the, if There's probably not a really a, a, a real silver bullet, but the truth is that if we were exploring up in Alaska, where we will undoubtedly find some billion barrels, billion barrel fields, if we pushed exploration for oil in the United States, all, all over the United States, we would soon dispel all the nervousness that these folks have all referred to. And that nervousness is what the speculators thrive on. And that I don't know what the Congress could do in terms of any regulation for the speculation. But that's, that's the name of the game as far as I'm concerned. Thank, thank you. you thank you, thank Mr. You. Ewing. Um, uh, Mr. Tipton in Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize uh, to, to you and to our panel members uh, for being late. Uh, coming in, just listening uh, to you, Ms. Riddell, when you were talking about a little bit of the, the international component, uh, when we are looking over into the Middle East, the threat of uh, Iran developing a nuclear weapon, uh, the threat, obviously, that concerns many of us, uh, that that places to Israel and then to world stability in terms of oil supply. You were commenting uh, accurately that uh, you know, this is a, a world market, a commodity for oil. Is it your estimation, uh, given the challenges we see in the Middle East, that uh, even if the price is driven by an international market, that it is in the best interests of the United States of America to be developing our own energy resources right here rather than relying on foreign markets to be able to deliver our oil. And part of the reason I say that is I was a little disturbed when uh, the President, through the World Import Export Bank, guaranteed a $2 billion loan to Brazil uh, to be able to drill off of their shores and say we want to be one of their best customers. Uh, would it be more sensible for us to be drilling on American soil, creating American jobs, and developing American energy certainty? Um, I absolutely agree that you know domestic energy production is a huge component to you know not only our national security but also our jobs. Um, as Mr. Squalacci uh, said, ga the natural gas production is more of a domestic commodity. I do think that there is a lot of opportunity to to make that transfer, that transition from such a oil-dependent um, nation to start moving into different areas, i.e., natural gas, where there's we have trillions of cubic feet of undeveloped natural gas in this country. Unfortunately, um, when the divergence of the oil and gas prices happened, not a lot of folks you cannot drill economically. So unless oil companies would like to volunteer their time and money, um, or there's, you're not going to see as much natural gas production. However, I think there's a huge opportunity for us to transition a lot of our um, baseload power to natural gas, some of our fleets to natural gas, and eventually maybe some of our, our own cars to natural gas. But every time you do that transition, you do fight higher prices. And for the average American, buying a car is expensive enough. But if you have to make a decision as to buy you know, an oil-based car or a natural gas-based car and the price difference is $15,000, um, it is not a hard decision for most Americans to make. So I do think, I absolutely think it is important. I think we can make a huge transition. Um, I also think we can start to ensure more of our security if we responsibly develop, it, develop these resources domestically. I appreciate that. And I think one thing we need to keep a focus on is uh, American jobs. Uh, in your testimony, you were talking about uh, over in Garfield County. And this past weekend, I happened to be in Rifle, Silk, Glenwood, uh, an area that uh, has lower unemployment, uh, typically. But if you drive a little bit further west into Mesa County, uh, we see effectively double-digit unemployment that is there. So when we d are talking about creating American energy certainty for our future and our security, uh, and all of you may want to chime in on this when it gets down to actually be, being able to create jobs, good-paying jobs. And uh, I can speak uh, with confidence. Uh, I have dealt with and have folks that I have talked to that actually have dirt under their fingernails, uh, that love the area. Uh, they want to make sure that it is done responsibly. 
but what kind of a role can uh, this positive development uh, actually play in terms of getting America back to work? Mr. Barber? Mr. Tipton, thank you. It is a, it's a great question that sets up a, a thought, I think. Um, there are some that think that, um, that the, the market for oil will be what it will be regardless of what we, what we produce here in these United States. And although I, I don't know that that is true, let us say for a moment that it is. We have an opportunity to produce federally owned minerals that, by the way, one dollar out of every eight that is produced, the value of those minerals goes back to the federal government. So right away there is a one-eighth partner in those wells, if you will, that is the federal government. They split those royalties with the, with the states that it is produced in. 52-48 percent, I think, is the split. But uh, if, if we are going to get $100 a barrel for oil, we are going to pay $100 a barrel for oil regardless of who we buy it from, if that is the situation. It seems tremendously valuable to me to do it in a fashion that, first of all, one-eighth of those dollars go back to the Federal Government. Uh, if we buy it from somewhere else, no, none of those dollars go to the Federal Government. And then we, we can look at what does the rest, the rest of that $100 come? Well, it comes from things like the money that goes to the local drilling company, the local roustabout cruel, the local permitting company, the, the, the roustabout employees, hotels, retail, uh, just a vast, vast uh, um, group of folks that, that when, when 9 or $10 million is spe spent drilling a, a horizontal uh, shale well that share in those, those, uh, those uh, prices that are out there for those services. If we give that up, all of those monies that are paid for those services go elsewhere. And I also worry that the other thing that can go elsewhere is the investment dollars of the companies that are willing to drill here but can't. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, were you going to have a second round? Okay. Um, you know, one, one thing I think that uh, I think would be a little interesting here, and um, Mr. Scalace, did I, Scalacci, sorry, uh, on that, that I'd kind of like to have you comment on. Um, the Colorado State Legislature recently passed a resolution uh, It was 12-1004 uh, to uh, that they passed on to the Bureau of, uh, to the BLM. In the resolution, it called on the BLM to revise its current restrictive resource plan in Colorado in order to increase oil and natural gas production in Colorado. Uh, was the state legislature wrong to be able to put that sort of a resolution forward with bipartisan support? Um, I, you know, I, I, of course, the, the nature of the resolution is such that it is a question of degree and what is too restrictive or what is not restrictive enough, I think, is a, a matter of, that people can have differing opinions about. I think it is certainly true that we need to encourage um, domestic energy development. I am not opposed to doing that. The, the uh, concern, I think, is, and one of the concerns relating to your earlier question, is just that we not get into a situation which we have seen so often in the Western United States of boom and bust kind of development cycles. We need a steady kind of pro process for development. And, and too often, uh, the exuberance of higher prices at one moment leads us to uh, go beyond perhaps where we should go with development and leads to then a bust cycle, which is, I think, uh, more detrimental than if we are able to do these things in a steady way. So I, I think that, that is the, the sort of um, difficult balance to, to try to find here. Uh, how can we have sort of steady development that achieves um, growth in jobs, that, that employs people, that um, is good for our, our local economy and for our, our national economy as well without overdoing it? And, and that is the temptation. It is a very difficult kind of thing. There is a lot of pressure uh, to move towards overdevelopment. But I think if we learn from the past, We'll know that there are limits to how far we ought to go in this direction. You know, I'm concerned about that very thing as well. When we're looking at Col you're a Colorado yes. as well. Uh, when we look in Colorado, uh, federal leases dropped, uh, you know, which I find shocking because the president's talking about putting Americans back to work, and we aren't creating the opportunity. Uh, we turned down the Keystone Pipeline, 20 plus thousand jobs uh, directly, 100 thousand indirect. 
that we could have created here in America. We look at our state, my congressional district, uh, where uh, we have people that are suffering right now, uh, not only with high gas prices, but just worried about being able to keep a roof over their head right now. Uh, Colorado federal leases dropped, contrary to what the President is trying to purport right now, that we are increasing production, but leases dropped from 320 in 2008 to 11 in 2011. So uh, are we seeing restrictive policies out of this administration uh, when it comes to some of our public lands? And again, let us underscore, we want to be able to do it responsibly. Yep. Uh, but we also want to be able to feed our children. We want our people to be able to work. I think that is a very fair question. And we have discussed this a little bit before um, about what the, how the drop in the price of natural gas has really affected interest in Federal leasing. Now, it is not the only factor, and I don't want to suggest to you that that is the only thing that is going on here. But there is no doubt when natural gas drops below $3 um, a thousand uh, cubic feet, um, there are significant economic reasons why the industry is not particularly interested in developing uh, those leases and bidding on them. It is a, it's a very cyclical kind of thing. Natural gas in the United States is actually up. Uh, significantly, uh, largely because of some of the domestic supplies that are being found in the eastern part of the United States from, from the big shale plays out there. So I, I don't, I'm, I'm not suggesting that there's nothing to the point that you're making. I would note that I believe the director of the BLM recently testified that about a quarter of the leases that the BLM has offered in the past few years uh, have gone without any bids on them. So uh, parcels have been nominated by industry and they're offered for lease and, and they're, they're not bid upon. And so um, it may just be what is happening with the market. And I don't think we should read too much into the fact that the current level of leasing is down. Okay. And I uh, will be happy, uh, we ought to certainly talk about this because I am talking to companies that are having leases held up. Uh, you know, it is up to 10 years, uh, well, nine years, I think, is the high mark uh, to be able to actually develop and be able to go to production. Uh, which I think greatly in, creates that boom and bust cycle that you are talking about, uh, because time is money uh, when it gets down to business and development and the tremendous capital investment that it takes uh, to be able to develop some of these resources that are out there. Uh, I would just kind of like to open this up a little bit, maybe if I, I do not want to overstretch, Mr. Chairman, in terms of time here. But Mr. West, do you have any additional questions? I'm good. Great. I'll just kind of wrap up. Uh, can you give us any examples, uh, and this may be open to the whole panel here, uh, where the President's domestic or foreign policies have uh, contributed to really what we're seeing at uh, the pump? You know, we're seeing increased costs uh, that are going on. The President talks about an all of the above energy policy, but it's a matter really in terms of the tax code of picking winners and losers, which he abhors on one hand and embraces on the other. Uh, you know, we. I think our colleagues, uh, at least on the Republican side, we need to have tax reform. Uh, it needs to be fat, flatter, fairer, and simpler. Uh, but right now we are seeing an administration policy that seems to be pretty convoluted uh, in terms of the real impacts uh, on the American people. And do you, Just give me some of your comments, if you would, in terms of the administration policies. Yes, sir. Mr. Barber. Thank you, Mr. Tipton. Uh, when one considers the the size of the companies that that are sort of represented and being discussed here, they are generally smaller production companies, and we like uh, like someone else who sells their um, product on a on a market. Um, we could be uh, just like a wheat farmer. Uh, the the individual wheat farmer doesn't get to determine what it is that they receive for their commodity. They grow it and choose to sell it or Put it in a in a granary and and sell it maybe when when markets are um, are different. So w one of the uh, one of the things that maybe we don't have the ability to do in a, in our positions is to determine what it is we get for that product. Because if we could, I'm sure we would want to get more for the price of natural gas right now. Natural gas is uh, is being um, it, it, there's certainly plenty of supply and in some cases. Uh, Operators are out there shutting in wells to uh, to not produce at the current current pricing. Um, I think in in terms of of liquids, uh, 
there may be situations where um, it would be better to be able to have a predictable price of some some no number uh, that is uh, is survivable uh, for for companies, but um, uh, certainly that that type of marketing is is beyond the scope of smaller companies. I'd just like to make a comment on that. I think that, uh, I, as I said, I do not get involved in that gas play, but I'm certainly conversant with it. Uh, I watched the oil play uh, plays in Texas in similar types of environment, and uh, the, the turned out that uh, many of those, the operator was the, the guy that owned the, controlled the acreage initially and turned it to somebody. It was the only guy that made a lot of money on it. Uh, in the Austin chalk play down there, we had you were lucky if you were getting two to one return on the investment. If you got a dry hole on the way, you were your your investors were very fortunate if they ever got their money back. What I think is going to happen in the gas play is that they're so it's a similar type of play in that the return on investment is not very big. Yes, you can get a well every time, so from a promoter standpoint, it's great. But what's going to happen is that all of these little guys that jumped in, and I mentioned a while ago that got burned, they'll turn their acreage. It's all going to be bought up by the majors, at which point the majors will have the, uh, the option of slowing down drilling so that they can get the price back up. Now, why would they, why would they do that? Right now, when you bring in one of those wells, they look great on initial potential. But very quickly, those things dive. And in order to keep the investors happy, you have to start drilling another well very quickly to get another good well that will also dive. So that you're, it's, it's what I have called the black hole of drilling. I, I know that's putting a bad slant on it, but it, because I'm not interested in it in the first place, I can't afford it. But that's what's going to happen at the point in time when the majors get sufficient control of all of those acres, they will then just gradually slow down on their drilling and the price of gas, they will get the price of gas to edge up again. Prediction. Um, thank you, Mr. Tipton. Um, I think for the gen, for the, for most of us, we are looking for a t simpler tax reform. However, I do know that um, the President is currently talking about removing the intangible drilling cost. Um, deduction that the oil and natural gas industry can take, in addition to um, not allowing the depletion rates, um, uh, deduction on depletion rates. And these are very frightening to smaller independents. These affect, um, these are not off, you know, these aren't give me's. These are standard deduction, manufacturing deductions that any manufacturing company would, would be able to get. These are, these are sunk costs. This is the cost of doing business. Um, if these tax, if, these, um, if he takes away these deductions from the oil and natural gas industry, it ca could cause a 25 percent loss in capital reinvestment, which then just basically turns around into loss of jobs and loss of domestic energy production, because companies will not be able to, smaller companies will not be able to operate under these stipulations. In addition, we hear a lot about the billion dollars that the, the majors make when, and although these profits may sound excessive, sometimes these are only a 6 percent rate of return for even the larger companies. So these are not, if you take, you know, what needs to be looked at is not the overall figure, because these are large, you know, in, um, international companies, but what really needs to be look at, looked at is the individual rate of return, sometimes as low as 6 percent. So some of the proposed tax reforms will and can put a lot of the smaller independents just completely out of business. Um. I think we can all agree that a simpler tax code would be a good thing. I, I doubt that many people, many Americans would disagree with that point. Uh, the devil, of course, is in the details. But I would like to focus more specifically on the relevance of your comment to energy policy. And here 
I hope that we can agree that we need to take the long view. Now, where our energy policy will be or where our mix of energy will be in 2050 may be a subject of disagreement. But the key point here is that we ought not try to have an energy policy just for the moment. I mean, we're, we know that the economy is down right now. People need jobs. And, and in the short term, we need to deal with those, those kinds of issues. But we also need, as a matter of planning, to think about where we want the, our energy policy to go. And I hope as, as the Congress is thinking about these broad issues about energy policy, that they will look at the big picture and look at the long term and try to adopt policies that will get us where we need to be in 30, 40, and even 50 years from now. I think that, that is really key. And if we, can, if we can reach some kind of agreement about where we need to go, I think we can see a clearer path for us to get there. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tipton. I would like to uh, ask one last question and uh, all of all you uh, individually, and that is to the smaller producers. Uh, what, if, if you were going to look at um, a single regulatory burden that would make the biggest difference in terms of reform, uh, and I know some of you just talked about deadlines and deadlines passing, but yet having to put pay permitting fees anyway, uh, irrespective of whether BLM does its role. But, but if you are going to look at one simple thing or one thing, specific thing, what would it be? And we will start with you, Mr. Barber, and we will go uh, to the left then. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. Uh, the singular issue that I would say uh, uh, that, uh, from my perspective, uh, that we could uh, do is actually, uh, fortunately, already in place in regulation. If we could get BLM back to the point where Federal Mineral Wells APDs are processed in the timeline that is called for in the regulation and is handled that way by some good BLM offices, if we could do that one single thing, that would make more APDs available for drilling um, and, and we would have better drilling prospects because they are directly following their own regulations rather than individual, personal, entrepreneurial interpretation regulation. Mr. Ewing. Mr. Kaufman, my, my whole pitch today relative to Ewing exploration has been applied to the Bighorn Basin, so I'm going to call, my comment is going to be related to that. Um, the BLM changed the rules uh, that we were using to determine whether or not leases should be issued. They were, for the first five years using the old RMP to, to do their adjudication as far as environmental uh, NEPA uh, uh, examination were concerned. Then suddenly, in 2010, when they pulled those parcels that I had on that map down from the sale, they pulled them down because a new information memorandum had been issued by Director Salazar back in the middle of 2010, well before that sale, telling his people that they had to start looking at wildlands characteristics up there in the Bighorn and throughout, I think, throughout the, the system. Once they did that, it put them in a position to just simply use what the stroke of the pen they have to go ahead and in spite of the fact that I would acquired all those acres under the old rules, in spite of the fact I drilled a well under those old rules, in spite of the fact we spent $250,000 getting new seismic under those rules and $70,000 to buy old seismic, they suddenly said, whoop, we're gonna, you've got to operate under the new rules and we're going to pull these down. And, if, and since they won't have them up again, late, based on the a letter I got less than two months ago, until the earliest in 2014, that will be 51 months from the time I first nominated those blue parcels for sale. And it will be after they have rejected them from a sale. They had them on the first sale. And I flew into Cheyenne and found out the next day they had all been removed from the sale. So. What my complaint is, is that they changed the rules. If we could get them to go back to the original RMP rules, which are what Congressman Olson uh, recommended they do, along with Bishop, along with the Western Energy Alliance, and just use those rules because that I am that they 
changed, allowed them to change the way they dealt with me, was simply develop, uh, called to be in, in, uh, uh, illegal by ju uh, uh, Judge Freudenthal's uh, decision. So everybody says, let's go back and use those. They just won't do it. Ms. Hordell, um, if there were one thing that you can change in terms of regulatory reform for smaller operators, what would it be? Um, because the BLM offices, although they all de operate under the Department of Interior, they often operate as very individual entities. You know, I don't think consolidating some of those processes in a single office within a single group might not be a bad idea, and allowing the BLM representatives in the field to do their part to supply those common offices with maybe some of the information to get these approvals through in a timely manner or to write the NEPA documents that are necessary for the approvals of the rights of ways and the APDs. So I am uh, I agree with Mr. Barber that there, there needs to be some timelines that need to be followed. Um, and I think maybe a consolidation rather than individuals and individual offices might be be a start to the solution. Okay. Mr. Swalachi? Um, sure. And, and again here, I think that there are no simple answers to the question. There are no, there's no simple rule change that will relieve some of the burdens. But I agree that if we can provide more certainty to the industry, particularly the small operators, that would be a good thing. And we ought to try to find ways to do that. One issue that I've focused on uh, over the past few years is my concern about the uh, the complexity of the land use planning process, both with the Forest Service and with the BLM. Just an example, in the resource management planning process that the BLM uses, uh, they get into sufficient detail that they are actually deciding on stipulations that belong in oil and gas leases that might be um, issued under uh, on particular lands. But that is not the end of the matter, because then when they go through the APD process, they may be imposing more restrictions and additions. It seems to me that while you can make an argument for that, we ought to simplify land use planning and avoid getting into the details when we haven't studied the particular lands where the operations are going in anyway. Let's use land use planning as kind of a zoning exercise, decide what we are going to do on particular lands and what we are not going to do on particular lands. And that creates a kind of certainty about where opportunities for the oil and gas ind industry are available. And then when development is, is going to take place, we can look at it comprehensively. Hopefully we have saved some resources that, we're, that are now being employed in the planning process and we can use them to help um, meet the deadlines that some of the folks are talking about here and then achieving uh, quicker action and more certainty for the industry. One of the items, exhibits that I put in your packet up there looks like this. It is a comparison between the number of employees that the WOGCC, Wyoming Oil and Gas Commission, have in Wyoming and the employees that the BLM has. And if you look at that, it tells you, this, I think, pretty much the story of why we are overregulated. As I pointed out earlier, I think before Mr. Tipton came in, the WOGCC has 44 employees. The BLM has 898 employees in this, adjudicating just the BLM lands in the state of Wyoming, not all of those lands that the, the uh, state deals with. The annual budget for the WOGCC is 2640000 The budget for the BLM is estimated to be $54 million a year. I mean, it, 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 what, what you all have to start to do if you are going to change the way this exploration goes on BLM lands, you have got to get into their budget and cut their funding and, make, and cut them down to size, because we don't need all of their help. All they do is hold back exploration. They don't help it proceed uh, forward. Mr. Ewing, that is what we call up here a jobs program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Tipton, any Mr. other comments? Jobs. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all so much for your testimony today. And I think, Mr. Ewing, uh, you raised a question uh, and, uh, about submitting additional testimony. And you and the, uh, the other witnesses, all of your witnesses, will have 14 legislative days to submit additional uh, comments and materials uh, into the record. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your testimony today. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh -oh.